That bloody train. Morning of the incident. 0637. All the conditions must be met. It has to be so smooth and sudden that nothing can be proven. Definitively, at least. It's a plan that rests on swiftness, chaos. A single attempt and zero second chances. Warning, booms the computerized voice. Please stand well away from the platform edge. The next train does not stop here. Nick is wandering towards his usual bench, the consummate creature of habit. He strides along the yellow line, just close enough for a strong shove to be sufficient, for his own forward momentum to betray him. My position behind the pillar leaves a distance of around three meters for me to cover when he passes. Diagonal trajectory, short burst of ballistic movement. My heart begins to race. It's now or never. A final brief check. No one on the platform. Now, I scream in my head. Then a few bounding strides. I slam into the back of him. He stumbles, yelps. <gasps> As I extend my arms and follow through the push, my hood flies back off my head and not accounted for this. He falls easier than expected though, hitting the tracks with another helpless grunt. <gasps> I glance around, still no one nearby. I retreat behind the pillar again just in time for the train to hurtle down the track. The noise it makes is sickening, a huge slab of meat smacking against metal. A split second later I hear a scream, coinciding with the screech of brakes. The rest is well rehearsed and simple. Three days later, given the information they had to hand, Detective Inspector Johnson was narrowing down his list of suspects. He's told that only six of Beth's employees use the train from the town centre to the business park. Shane, Ian, Nick, Tara, Sanjay, and Kate. Placing one victim and five potential perpetrators at the scene of the crime. we we'll would like to question your whole team, though, the detective said. Unfortunately, we can't rule any of them out just yet. The mood at Elkin graphic design was tense, solemn. Beth Elkin's nerves had been frayed for a fortnight, from the moment she'd interviewed for the project manager position. Several people vying for a single role, for the chance to double their salary, was bound to cause contention. Such a thing could produce unrest in the happiest of companies. And now the police were citing it as a motive for murder. It's no wonder the woman hadn't slept. In the last week, she'd reduced her team to a series of bland descriptions. Ian, early twenties, pale and blonde, crew cut, average height. Kate and Laura, two white brunettes, both in their early thirties with shoulder length hair, the latter taller and bespectacled. Sanjay and Vikram, two clean shaven men of Indian heritage, the former significantly older with a slighter frame. Tara, 30, mixed race, short and overweight. Felix and Shane, both tall, white, bold and brown bearded. The former in his early 30s and the latter a decade older. Nick, the deceased, black, late 40s, thinning hair, slim and narrow of shoulder. Margaret, East Asian, petite, just turned 50. Let's start with the ones who don't use the train the detective said calmly. Well, Margaret drives in with Laura, as I'm sure they've already told you. Yes. Uh, Vikram also drives in, and he actually arrived just before seven, so he wouldn't have had enough time to get from the station. Beth nodded. I, I discount Felix too. He cycles in, arrived about 7.15. With all due respect, this is my investigation. I'll decide who can be ruled out. Sorry, Detective. To your knowledge, do those five always get that train? 6.45 from High Street. Yes, our working day commences at 8am, but most of the team come in an hour earlier so they can leave at 3pm, or just after. When Detective Johnson left her office, Beth's mind went into overdrive, forging a series of miserable connections. 
Nick Greaves had likely been pushed to his death by someone they all shared an office with. A person she'd employed. A person she might have even considered a friend. The solid alibis of Margaret, Laura and Vikram were at least of some comfort. In her mind she'd also ruled out Felix, Sanjay, Kate and Tara and she hoped the detective would quickly do the same. Sanjay and Felix were two vegan pacifists, neither capable of hurting a fly. Tara was a kind-hearted mother of two, and Kate frequently showed remorse for the most minor of transgressions. Besides, in almost every aspect all four of them behaved selflessly. If the recent promotion had been based on trustworthiness or strength of character, any one of them would have beaten Nick. God rest his soul. She thought of the other suspects, as they were now painfully being called. Only Kate, Felix, Shane, Sanjay and Ian had applied for the project manager position, which surely meant that Tara would be stripped of motive, and bolstering the woman's innocence was her own fondness of the deceased. Beth was forced to agree with the detective then, when he proposed that these five interviewees had the most to gain from Nick's sudden demise. But why are the police so certain of foul play? Jake asked her that evening at dinner. Seems I'm always reading about people hurling themselves in front of trains. No, Beth replied. Nick would never do that. And certainly not after receiving the promotion he'd wanted for years. Her husband nodded. Police give you their reason? Coroner's findings. That's all he'd say. Ah, there you go. Must have been some indication of a struggle. Inconsistent bruising, perhaps? God, they really think it was someone from your team. That's the thing. No one has said it outright, but I get the impression my lot are the only ones who ever get that train from that platform at that time in the morning. I see. Her husband clenched his jaw. Look, maybe you should close the office just until they make an arrest. But that could take weeks. Okay, fine, but I really don't like the idea of you going in and I'll tell Shane, Ian and Sanjay that they can all work from home for the time being. Yeah? Why them? Those three and Kate are the prime suspects. And perhaps I'm being sexist, but... No, that has been interrupted. Do whatever makes you feel safer. That Saturday evening, Kate Bishop answered her front door to a uniformed female police officer and a man in a grey suit who quickly introduced himself as Detective Inspector Johnson. And although she'd been expecting the visit, her legs still trembled as she led them into her living room. After promptly declining her offer for a hot drink, the detective delved straight into his evidently pre-planned series of questions. He started by confirming her whereabouts at the time of the murder, and that was exactly how he referred to it. There was no mincing of words. Upon answering the initial questions honestly, without hesitation, Kate appeared to be offered a moment of reprieve. Detective Johnson scrawled into a notebook for a minute or so, before placing it down on the coffee table and letting out a small sigh. Look, he said gently, I can tell you're scared, love, and I don't want to stress you out any more than I need to. Got no intention of taking you into the station today. I'm just going to ask a few more questions and then we'll leave you in peace. Kate nodded. I I'll answer as best as I can. I want you to find out what happened as much as anyone. Good. Let's talk about work then, Mrs Elkin. Sorry, Beth. Tells us she interviewed you for a promotion recently. Project manager, is that right? Yes, that's right. Big step up in responsibility, she said. Huge step up in pay. Yes, but... But Nick got the job. Must have been disappointing. A little, yes. I understood, though. Did you? Kate nodded. He had more experience. A couple people did, actually. I was just happy to be considered. What about the other three? The, the other three? Yes. Shane, Ian and Sanjay. You think any of them were just happy to be considered? Um, I, I, I don't know, you'd have to... And you saw them on the platform, did you? Um, no, no. No, I... But you saw Nick. Detective Johnson glanced at the clipboard on his lap. Says here you saw him get hit by the train. Kate nodded. 
Her heart suddenly started thudding. She could feel it in her temples. It all happened so fast and still made her sick to think of it. She descended the steps just in time to see a colleague on the tracks. Then a millisecond later, the train devoured him. Did you see someone push him? Kate shook her head. And where were Shane and Ian? Sorry? Shane and Ian. Antara and Sanjay, come to think of it. None of them had denied being at the train station that morning. While well, they were sitting on the platform benches minding their own business while their colleague fell onto the tracks. The, the, the train that hit him didn't stop at our station. Our one wasn't due to arrive for another five minutes. We know that, Kate. He glanced at the clipboard. He told the attending officer that he would ascend in the stairs just before 20 to 6 and you emerged on the platform right in time to see Nick being hit. Yes, Kate lowered her head. But this is the issue. This places you at the scene at a rather unfortunate time. If you're claiming to be the only other person on the platform, within seconds of your colleague being struck. I'm not claiming that, Kate replied, almost involuntarily. You're not? There was... Shane. Shane was there. The detective glanced at his colleague. Kate, are you changing your witness statement? She shook her head. No, I... Because that's what it sounds like. Before, you said... The officer was just asking about Nick, Kate said with unexpected firmness. But I did see someone else on the platform, moving away. This is a rather large thing to leave out of a statement, Kate. I was in shock. I was just focusing on Nick. But the other per... Shane... He just said. I only saw the back of him. Okay. Rather than naming people then, why don't you just give us a description? Kate nodded. Bold. Pale. Black bomber jacket. Bold, I see one male wearing a black bomber jacket. How tall are they? Um, tall. Over six foot. Same height as Shane. Please avoid making comparisons. Where was this person in relation to Nick? They were walking along the platform. Just as Nick was being hit by the train? Yes. As the detective attempted to continue with his questioning, he was halted by the interviewee, who started sobbing hysterically. This was turning into the type of case he dreaded. Despite having four prime suspects at the crime scene with equal motive, he lacked a single form of clear physical evidence. Not only were the CCTV cameras broken, which would probably mean a good lawsuit for the family. Nothing showing any of the suspects even entering the train station, let alone the platform in question. The ticket barriers had also not been in operation, and the train driver's account was flimsy at best. Ostensibly then, any unscrupulous individual could have wandered onto platform six without a ticket, shoved Nick Greaves onto the rails, and promptly left the scene. Unless someone handed him a sudden confession, the detective would have to start thinking creatively. So, let's get this straight, he announced an hour later, now facing Shane Fenton in the living room of his tiny apartment. He stepped onto platform 6 at around 6.40am. By this point, Nick Greaves had already been struck by the train. I guess so, he said in a flat voice. And who else was on the platform? Kate. Where was she standing when you saw her? Just past the bottom of the staircase. Right. Because her version of events differs from this. According to her, you were already on the platform. The detective made firm eye contact with the man as these words were acknowledged, searching him for all the predictable tells, minute cues that might otherwise go unnoticed. But Shane Fenton was impassive as he returned eye contact for a moment. She's mistaken, he replied slowly and evenly. I don't know why she'd say that. Okay, what happened next? Did you try to speak to Kate? I walked past her. Then I heard that train screeching to a halt further down the line. And you something was wrong. So I walked back to find someone. Two men in high-vis jackets rushed past me on the stairs. So you passed her twice? Shane opened his mouth, then paused. Yes, I suppose I did. What were you wearing? Excuse me? It's not a difficult question. 
How are you dressed? Oh, my black bomber jacket, white shirt underneath, black trousers and black shoes. The detective glanced at his colleague before writing this down. Was there anyone else on the platform, or just Kate? Shane seemed to consider this carefully. I wasn't really paying attention. The detective frowned. He said you walked along the platform, and you and Kate seemed to be in agreement that she didn't get much further than the stairs. Was there anyone else with you or not? He let out a small sigh. No, then. I didn't see anyone else. When I went back up to the ground floor, Sanjay and Taro were walking towards me. Ah, yes. You spoke to them. Did I? Quote, Sorry, guys. I think our train might be cancelled. The detective paused, again looking for giveaway signs that never came. What made you say that? Shane shook his head. Sorry, I don't remember saying it. The detective looked to his colleague once more, then paused for several seconds. Shane Fenton, I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. Shane was read his rights, and a moment later he was handcuffed and pushed into the back of a patrol car. It wasn't totally satisfying, however. The detective knew he didn't have enough to make anything stick. Not yet. But there was hope. His primary tool was the process of elimination. Of the six people with motive, Shane, Ian, Sanjay, Felix, Kate and Tara, Felix could be ruled out. And despite being at the scene, the same could be said for Sanjay and Tara. Both claimed to have never left the ground floor of the station that morning, and now Shane had corroborated this story. The messiness started with Ian, however the youngest suspect, who seemed the most nervous and unsure of himself. Conflicting with Kate's account, and also Shane's, he claimed to have been on the platform before Nick was flattened by the train. Why had his presence gone totally unnoticed by the other two? After being told he was not under arrest, the young man was also brought to the police station for further questioning. Just relax, Ian, Detective Johnson said in a fatherly tone. I don't want you to make any mistakes. What time do you think you walked down onto the platform that morning? I was early. Earlier than usual. I'd been late the morning before and almost missed the 6.45, so... How early? Can you give us a rough time? He pursed his lips, screwing his mouth into a tight crease. Like half six, maybe twenty-five past. Okay, that's good. And that is early. He must have seen the whole thing. Ian interrupted the detective with a quick shake of his head. I was sat down on the seats at the far end. I had my headphones in and I was messing around on my phone. But even if you weren't paying attention, those seats are fairly close to where it happened. The detective paused and softened his voice. We're just trying to figure out if your colleague jumped or if he was pushed. You must have seen some... I didn't see anything, Ian yelped. Just heard it. He took a few short, sharp breaths, and his next utterance was released as a squeal. The sound! It was... Okay, son. Take a minute. The detective paused again. Try not to linger on the sound you heard. Just want to ascertain who was on the platform with you. Let's start with Sanjay and Tara. Ian shook his head. No, they never came down. And Felix? Ian's head shot up at this. Felix? Why would Felix be there? He cycles. I've never seen him get... Okay, and Sanjay? Again, he drives. I don't know why... Alright, what about Kate? He nodded. She was there. She was crying. Okay. And Shane? Ian locked eyes with the detective, then slowly nodded his head. I only remember seeing the back of him, and only for a second. He was walking away up to the station. What was he wearing? Um, all black. Black bomber jacket, black trousers and shoes. The detective and attending officer shared a look. All right, let's take a break. 
Beth felt like her sanity was hanging on by a thread. And what would have usually been a fairly quiet business period suddenly felt strained and hectic. Ten days and still no answers. Kate and Tara were now both off as stress. Ian, Sanjay and Shane were still resigned to work from home. Although no sudden revelations had come to her, no memories of fraught conversations or animosity between her employees, she could no longer look at any of them the same. Laura was the person she'd always trusted the least. The woman just seemed too quiet and secretive. But she and Margaret were now in the clear. And while Shane and Ian were both young and equally ambitious, ruthless, some might even say, neither of them had ever struck her as violent or cruel or calculated. The only vague silver lining she could discern was that high-pressure situations like these tended to bring out the best in some people. Vikram and Felix, two mild-mannered men of middle age, had noticeably upped their output, though it made her slightly sick to even think of making such decisions. She was sure she'd be offering the vacant project manager role to one of them, or Margaret, by the end of the week. Morning of the Incident, 0639. The rest is well rehearsed and simple. Try not to be seen, then hurry up the second set of stairs. I decide not to put my hood up again. This action could look suspicious in itself. I don't look back, just stride briskly to the stairs, slowing to a casual walk when I reach the top. Though I keep my head down, I needn't worry. No one is around. The men in high-vis jackets are gone likely attending to the scene. In any case, they hadn't noticed me when I entered the station. I'd slip past them like a ghost. When I emerge outside, I find my bike, chained up at the rear of the station. I remove my bomber jacket and stuff it into my bag. Slightly wistful, it's comfy, and this is undoubtedly the last time I'll ever wear it. Despite having plenty of time, I cycle faster than usual. And when I pull up at the office, I glance at my watch. 7.09. This is good. I catch my breath as I position my bike under the shelter, slowly locking it up with trembling hands. Come on, calm down, I say to myself. This seems to help, and I enter the office with a painted-on smile. Morning, Felix, Beth says, beaming. Good morning, I reply. Glancing around, waving at Margaret, then Vikram. Gosh, where is everyone? Beth nods. I was thinking the same thing. That bloody train. Yes, I agree before tutting. That bloody train. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, please like it and share it around. And if you're feeling especially generous, hit the subscribe button.